And thanks for connecting with us again on the Edgy Talk Show. The Edgy Talk Show, as always, is brought to you by the Ministry of Education in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal. Guess what? This week we're talking about the colleges of education because for the very first time in the history of the country, we have a cohort graduating from these colleges with a Bachelor of Education degree. What are the success stories, the lessons so far, and what is informing the way forward? My guest is Professor Mohamed Salifu, Director General of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. We'll delve deeper into the fidelity of implementation of the BA program when we return from this break. Please stay with us. Hello there, and we're grateful that you're still staying with us here on the Edgy Talk Show. The Edgy Talk Show, as always, is brought to you by the Ministry of Education in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal. As I was indicating earlier, we're talking about the fidelity of implementation of the Bachelor of Education program in all 46 colleges of education. Well, uh, for those of you who are wondering who's helping us with the discussion, we are talking to Professor Mohamed Salifu. He is the Director General of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, GTEC. And for those of you who do not know about GTEC, you're hearing it for the first time. GTEC has oversight responsibility over all the tertiary institutions, including these 46 uh, public colleges of education that we are talking about here. So he has that oversight responsibility and he knows best. Professor, welcome to the Edge Talk Show. Thank you very much. And uh, I must say it's been a long journey, you agree. Uh, but congratulations to you. The first batch of the BA uh, teachers uh, completed and graduated uh, in the last academic year. But how has the journey been for you so far? Well, uh, it's been exciting. Uh, but uh, there have been times when uh, this has given you anxious uh, moments. Uh, when you have a product that you've developed uh, you know that is going to make a very significant difference. This is the most uh, important reform that has taken place within the teacher education space. You have all the nuts and bolts in place. All that you need to do is roll it out. Uh, you cannot afford but be quite expectant and anxious uh, about that. Uh, so it's been exciting. Uh, we've had our moments of uh, anxiety, uh, teacher, unions you know taking uh, their program to ransom uh, they time it to the beginning and they tell you right we had this grievance if you don't address <laughs> that we are not moving forward right. and unfortunately for this bike that is what they experienced from the very beginning and when they were about to graduate we experienced a similar situation uh, but it's overall it's been very exciting and uh, i'm happy to look back on what has happened uh, within these last uh, four to five years. In fact, we'll be talking about the <coughs> fidelity of implementation proper, uh, but there's the concern about even why the need for the BA program in our colleges of education in the first place. Okay. What have you got to say about that? As well? Yes, you know, as I said, uh, this was probably the most consequential reform that took place within the teacher education space. Uh, the main reason we had to do it was that, look, we had persistent, you know, uh, non-performance, you know, of uh, children in the school system. Uh, learning outcomes were terrible, and uh, one of the key factors that were found, you know, to be contributing to that was the level of preparation of teachers. So actually, in the beginning, we set about just trying to reform the program. Uh, as you recall, it was a Diploma of Education, oh. Uh, and we set out to just reform that, make sure it was fit for purpose. But the more we went through the deliberations and consultations, uh, tried to align that to what the expectations of a teacher in the new dispensation would look like, uh, the more we drifted towards, you know, a Bachelor of Education program. Because we determined that in order to meet all the objectives of delivering a teacher who will be fit for purpose in affecting the learning outcomes, 
Uh, we needed to do it for a little more extended period. We had to change the way it's delivered, and the structure had to be different. Many, many different things about it. And so, inevitably, we ended up with a Bachelor of Education. And that also went down to inform policy in the recruitment of teachers. So since the introduction, uh, the policy now is that the minimum qualification to teach in the school system has to be a bachelor's degree. How did you feel seeing the first batch graduate? Very, very excited. Mm. Very excited uh, because at least it had given us a full cohort, you know, from year one to year four. Mm -hmm. And we had a chance now to reflect on how we had done things mm. uh, to see whether we're on track so that we can uh, realign it. And I suppose that brings us to the fidelity of implementation oh. thing. Yeah. And since we, we've been mentioning that uh, mm. terminology on the program, yeah. I'm sure that there are some who would want to follow us and learn more about uh, mm. the technicalities involved. So when you talk about the fidelity of implementation, mm. basically what are we referring to? Oh, I think everybody knows about fidelity, <laughs> isn't it? So these are terminologies that people are familiar with. Mm. How faithful have you been to the course and the process? A new structure has been done. There's a new curriculum, new specialisms, new ways of teaching, delivery. Are we really going according to what has been put together in terms of expectations? This is important because uh, there's a, a certain theory of change in there mm -hmm. that you needed this process to deliver a certain type of teacher who will have a certain impact in the classroom. So actually, in evaluating the impact of the beard, it would take us a much longer time to do that because ultimately it has to reflect in the learning outcomes. But you've done the upstream side, and you want to be sure that all the assumptions that you've put in place, those assumptions have, been, uh, have materialized. And if those have materialized, then you can look forward to the downstream side and see how it will impact. So, so essentially, that's why we needed to do the uh, fidelity of implementation. Uh, how faithful have we been to the commitments in the new way and structure of delivery? So, so I guess that even explains why you are carrying out the exercise in yeah, the first place. That's one of several reasons. Right, but, but what are the focal areas? Yes. Why, what are you focusing on? And, and what do you seek to achieve out of this exercise? OK. So uh, there were principally about seven areas that we try to focus on. Uh, the first one is adherence. Are we really being faithful to the implementation process? Uh, there's exposure element in there because the structure had changed. You had new teaching techniques, you know, new methods of uh, training the teacher trainee, yeah. which we needed to do, uh, new resources that had to be used. Are the students really being exposed to that? And are they feeling the change in the way this has been done? Uh, there are quality assurance uh, uh, bits. You know, how is the quality assurance arrangement uh, put in place? Uh, the complexity of the assignment is uh, what are some of the challenges uh, that the program is facing? And so you put all these things together under the seven broad categories. Then it gives you a full picture about really what is going on uh, to inform us on uh, what needs to be done, correctional mechanisms that need to be put in place to ensure we are really on track to deliver on that upstream side so that we can hope to have impact in the downstream. But Prof, that, that exercise has traveled really far. I'm sure that by now you're beginning to identify some unique features about the BEARD program, particularly within the context that we're talking about it mm. now. Mm. What were some of these milestones that, of course, you, you can identify mm. and say were adding value to the mm. process itself? OK. So to start with, for the very first time, mm -hmm. we put together a program, the BEARD program, that is responding to certain specific aspirational objectives. These aspirational objectives are captured in four different types of policy instruments that will guide that. Previously, we just trained the teachers the best way we could. Now, we have a national teaching uh, teacher standard, which is specifying what the requirements of a good teacher in the classroom will be. We have an assessment. Uh, we have teachers' education curriculum framework, which will guide the universities in developing a curriculum 
that will respond to the teaching uh, teacher standards. Then you have an assessment framework, which will be used to assess the actual delivery so that you can uh, expect to see the outcomes in terms of impact of the training on the students. And then we also had another policy strand which was focusing on school partnerships. Uh, how do the training institutions whose laboratories, so to speak, are the partner schools, how are they, what kind of relationships do, we, do they have with the schools, and how is the new teaching, uh, teacher preparation impacting in the classroom. So all these things put together was driving the focus of the BA, you know, uh, teacher education uh, program. Prof, what would you say is that one, I mean, that single factor that sustained the policy, a uh, reason for which we're getting to this point at which we are now? Okay. I, I think one of the strengths that go for this is that there was uh, national ownership of the program across board. We have quite a lot of stakeholders in that teacher education space. In developing uh, the curriculum framework, I believe that this was one of the processes that uh, uh, I mentioned to some stakeholders the other day, where we even over consulted in terms of bringing people on board, letting them understand what their needs are and why we needed to go in the direction that we are going. And these are the regulators, you know, the National Teaching Council, uh, who are supposed to regulate the professional side of the teaching, those who use the teachers, uh, I'm talking about Ghana Education Service, uh, who own the, the schools, uh, GTEC obviously because we have that responsibility over the colleges of education, and uh, all kinds of you know people with diverse backgrounds that impact, and then the universities, you know, to whom the colleges were actually aligned, you know, for mentorship. Everybody was part of the process. But the unions give you a hard time. Um, <laughs> okay, I mean, the unions did because um, I think as with every policy initiative, when they find that government has a vested interest in getting this thing done, this is so important to be done, they themselves appreciate the value. And so if they have a grievance, there's always a tendency for them to say, look, Let's hold this thing because this is really where we can get right. these people to speak if, if, if we stall the progress a little bit. But even they came around, you know, even they came around right. because they understood that this was the most consequential thing that uh, was taking place mm -hmm. in that space. So, I mean, carrying out the FOI, I'm sure that you've identified some best performing schools. Mm -hmm. Uh, the least ones are also there. Mm. We do not intend to do the name, naming and shaming at this point, <laughs> uh, but we'll get into that detail, try and talk about some of the schools and, and the unique challenges they are mm. facing. Mm. So don't go anywhere. Stick with us here on the Edge Talk Show. When we return, we'll talk about these schools, some of the unique challenges affecting the program and how we can make it of better quality. Stay with us. The show is brought to you by the Ministry of Education in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal. We'll be right back. Please stay. We're spending time with uh, Professor Mohamed Salifu, Director General of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. And guess what? We're simply talking about the fidelity of implementation of the Bachelor of Education program. Uh, now you know what necessitated this whole exercise and how the journey has been so far. But now we're moving into another phase of uh, the project. And Prof, I was just talking about uh, I mean, why, of course, is this, is, this whole exercise is necessary in the first place. And I'd like to find out at this point if you identified some high-performing colleges when, when you carried out the FOI. After that exercise, what do you feel that other colleges can be learning from these high-performing schools so that we achieve the purpose for which the BEAD was introduced? As a result of the uh, exercise, uh, the FOI, exercise. 
we found that um, about three out of four of the colleges were doing just as was required. Uh, just barely enough to conform to the new standards and the new processes. Uh, but uh, seven of them, seven out of the 46, were really top-notch uh, based on the metrics that were used. Uh, I'm not sure whether you want me to name the, the colleges, but uh, I think it's good since uh, this is a, a, a fresh intervention. You are encouraging everybody to go along. Right. It's not about naming and shaming. It's about encouraging others to adopt what the best practices are. So perhaps it's better to focus on the key issues, the success factors, rather than uh, say this was the best performing or, uh, or the other one was not doing too well. Unfortunately, about five of the colleges uh, didn't you know, sufficiently measure up to the expectation. And we think that there's a huge you know, uh, room for improvement as far as they are concerned. Um, yeah, so we did identify top performing colleges uh, and the success factors really uh, mainly was the kind of leadership that was uh, provided by uh, the college uh, management. Uh, there was collective ownership. Everybody understood what was supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. They effectively utilized the committee system and put people in charge at various uh, uh, levels. Uh, they took their uh, capacity development quite serious, seriously. Professional development sessions were also taken quite seriously. And you find that all in all, these put together delivered them quite uh, you know, great results in terms of their adherence to uh, the new dispensation. But, but just as you were indicating, there's yeah. a need for us to learn the best standards. Yeah. So obviously, there'll be a need for us to look at the overarching aim and or say the factors mm. that really contributed to the success story yeah. so that these underperforming ones can learn from. So what are some of the findings in the FOI that you know we, we can pick up on, okay. especially from the perspective of these underperforming institutions? All right. So, so that, that, that is what I was hinting at yeah. uh, earlier, earlier. And, mm. and that was uh, in respect of the kind of leadership mm -hmm. that uh, is available in the college. Oh. So what we found was that in the top performing uh, colleges, you found leadership that understood exactly what the new curriculum requirements were. Uh, they understood also that there had to be collective ownership of the processes. Uh, there was sufficiently uh, delegated responsibilities. Uh, in terms of determination of priorities, with the few resor little resources that they have, People had stakes in deciding where you apply the resources uh, in terms of priorities. And they took their professional development sessions quite seriously. So these were the colleges which were literally playing to the rule. Because all these success factors had been identified and been part of the planning process. And all that they needed to do was to uh, ensure that the institutional uh, framework for operation uh, complied with that, and that's exactly what they did. Okay, but Prof, GTEC may be the regulator, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. but there's a need for us to, I mean, collaborate, also stakeholders coming on board to ensure that the implementation of the Bachelor of Education program itself becomes mm -hmm. a success, mm -hmm. and we sustain the gains that have been made over the years. Mm -hmm. So, from your perspective, um, as an outfit, what are you doing together with the other agencies to ensure that you support the program? Okay, so the, our role uh, essentially will flow out of the oversight and supervision that we provide. Yeah. Uh, we notice, for example, cross-cutting issues like uh, insufficient infrastructure. Okay. Uh, the beginning and end of it will be with GTEC, okay. you know, and uh, we've actually worked with the ministry and the GUT fund to try and address some of the infrastructure uh, issues. Uh, unfortunately, it's become an issue because when we started the program, the pace of investment, we knew that we needed to invest in expansion of infrastructure, but the pace did not actually, you know, catch up with uh, the rollout, mm -hmm. you know. But now some very uh, specific steps have been taken, like we are building uh, hostels, uh, minimum 300-bed hostels in all the institutions. That will be the first stage, and the next stage will be 
looking at the classroom facilities and all that. There are also capacity issues in terms of personnel, training of uh, the teachers, the tutors, you know, who teach the trainee mm -hmm. teachers. Uh, it's also something you, you that... You see a problem. Yeah, in some respects, especially when you see, uh, you look at the deficiencies, uh, the shortfalls in the, uh, I wouldn't say bottom five, in the five that had the biggest potential for improvement, mm -hmm. uh, you will find that, you know, uh, we had some issues in there, apart from the leadership, uh, they need a lot of capacity uh, development and uh, a number of facilities also need to be put in place. So training, getting the right leadership in place, providing the infrastructure, generally speaking, they come directly to us. And encouraging them to imbibe this culture of excellence. You have to put in place uh, quality assurance uh, mechanisms. Uh, some did not even have functioning quality assurance systems and uh, processes. As a tertiary education institution, that is fundamental. So you need to have that in place. On an ongoing basis, it has to be part of the institutional culture. And then when we come in our oversight, we just check to make sure that you are compliant. And I think these are the areas in which GTEC can, can help. And you know, help them looking ahead also in terms of where the institution goes. Uh, future development and the priorities, you know, of the college, uh, how to tweak the processes in such a way that they get back on track. I think these are things that we need to facilitate. But Paul, from, from your point, you're conceding that mm -hmm. obviously there may be some shortfall. And, and of course, many will pardon the schools for that. This is the first time we are running uh, this program mm -hmm. in the colleges of education. So from the FOI, mm -hmm. Did you identify some shortfalls, some, some challenges, and what are some of the possible ways by which we could resolve them? Okay, so the shortfalls were exactly the reverse side of the success factors. You know, we've identified success factors in there which projected those uh, seven top performing colleges to the position they were. Mm -hmm. It was a lack of many of these things in the, the ones that were not you know, performing as well that was largely accountable for that. The leadership themselves not uh, fully appreciating what that new dispensation and you know requirements are, or working in a way that is not synergistic. You know, uh, one person decides to direct everybody, and uh, <laughs> there's no collective ownership. Of course, some of them would have had serious infrastructure, you know, gaps, and uh, there are some five. Uh, the last five colleges of education that were added to this 46 to make the 46 have peculiar challenges you know and uh, in terms of infrastructure in terms of infrastructure but and actually and, and, and actually leadership as mm. well but that would be so a big problem to solve it, it, it is it is but uh, we are working at it the good thing is that as i said three quarters three quarters of the colleges are good to go uh, another 15 percent actually top performing so, you know, in effect, almost 90% of them are doing exactly what is expected of them with the resources that they have. All that we need to do is to make sure we bring up the rest of them who are lagging behind. And these interventions that are listed, I think, uh, should be uh, adequate enough to address those challenges. But, Prof, th these may be challenges, obviously, uh, but what it is also suggesting to me is that the fidelity of implementation as an exercise itself has brought to the fore some critical issues uh, that will help in reforming or perhaps shaping and uh, giving better outcomes in terms of the implementation of the BA program itself. Do you intend to sustain the exercise or this is just a one-off that you'd be carrying out on the program? Uh, definitely, this is something that we need to continue on a regular basis. Uh, not that itself is addressing the problems, okay. but it's actually the such light that is being thrown mm. into the constraints and bottlenecks or the misalignment issues in terms of the direction in which the program right. should be going. So the more we do that, the more uh, we identify the issues that gives us an opportunity to correct the path so that we stay on track. Uh, like I said in the beginning, unless we can get the processes working exactly as planned in the upstream, we cannot expect to get a difference in the downstream. And the ultimate objective is to get 
learning outcomes in the school system improve. So we need to monitor this and make sure it continues to work. In fact, the immediate thing we are going to do is to pick the results, the findings as we have it here, and try and get craft a document, uh, uh, if you like, an implementation framework for getting everybody who is slightly off track back on track so that they can deliver on the results that, that we expect them to. And I hope that would include the less privileged, the less five, well, not, the, five the set of five is Naturally, naturally. The set of five actually would uh, require special attention. So uh, for the more than three quarters or so and the top performing ones, uh, obviously what you can do is I, the top performing can share these, their institutional practices yeah. with the ones that yeah. are, you know, a little uh, short of the expectation. And then, you know, we can encourage them uh, to work together and provide whatever facilitation. Uh, it's been required. amazing talking to you, and I'm sure that uh, you've put in a lot of work trying to make this succeed. But, but what do you see to be the future for uh, the colleges of education with this continuous running of, of the BA program? Okay, so as it stands now, we just do what it is that we know to do best. Mm -hmm. uh, do the program, try and perfect the processes and make sure that we are doing it exactly as planned. It's res being responsive to all those policy uh, documents that we have referred to. Uh, it's producing the kind of teachers we want. Uh, the teachers are being taught on a curriculum framework, a specific curriculum that is responding to their needs. They are being assessed appropriately so that their outcomes can be determined and that they are working as close as possible with the partner schools. Because ultimately, that's the kind of, uh, if you like, laboratory experience, practical experience they need to be able to take out into the school system, yeah. where hopefully the ultimate objective of these reforms will be felt, and that is improvement in the learning outcomes. Prof, I'm grateful that you've been able to join us. And uh, indeed, the future is bright for the uh, BA program. So the challenge is out there to all the 46 colleges of education. You need to make this a success as well. But that's all time will allow us uh, in terms of talking about the fidelity of implementation of the Bachelor of Education program in all the 46 colleges of education. I'm blessed to guy. And of course, we'll see you in the next episode. We'll explore some other matters confronting the education sector. It's been the Edu Talk Show brought to you by the Ministry of Education in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal. Bye bye for now.